first, I just want to say happy birthday, Crossroads. Seriously, 24 years, that's absolutely amazing. And I mean, that's cool. And I think just this week is a big, is just a snapshot of really who we are as a, a church. I mean, I thought about that as they were saying 46 kids came to faith in Jesus Christ. And I look at our, our back wall, it's uh, the, the Great Commission, and this is who we, what we stand for, saying we really want to go into all the world, and we want to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ. We believe in the next generation. I mean, I was so excited about the next generation this week as I, uh, as I watched our, our, our children and, and the, the foundation of what, what people did in, in their life. Also, as I hung out with the, with the youth and I watched them do some amazing things. In fact, even got some poison ivy thanks to them too. But they're amazing. I mean, our next generation is incredible and I can't wait for that. And, and just the, also just seeing you as volunteers our staff, our volunteers, I watched our kids just get blown away by just your love, by your care, by all that you did. Well done, well done, well done. And I just, uh, I'm so thankful to be a part of this amazing, amazing church. So well done, you guys. And also want to say hi to those who are watching online around the country and around the world. We probably have some grandparents watching this week of, of uh, seeing your kids out there, and we welcome you as, uh, as well. You know, we were in a study, as, as she said, on, called When Pigs Fly. It's a study on, on miracles, of, uh, some of the miracles of the Bible. And we've taken a look at miracles of healing. We're going to take a look at miracles of deliverance. This week, we're going to take a look at miracles of protection and really how God sees us through difficult times. We're going to see miracles of provision as, uh, as well because, you know, ask the question, do you believe in miracles? We in this house, we not only believe in miracles, we expect miracles. They're part of who we are. They're part of our DNA. We expect miracles of... Uh, of all those things because and why we're talking about it is because there's times in your life you're going to need miracles of healing there's going to be times in your life where you need miracles of deliverance there's going to be times in your life where you need miracles of protection all those things so we're going to look at them and we're going to look at what the the word of god says and we're going to start out today with something a little different and and, uh, and if you've ever been in a time maybe a season of life right now where it just feels like life kicks you upside the head you know what i'm talking about those times where it is just tough 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 Maybe it's a day, maybe it's a week, maybe it's a whole season, whatever it is. Maybe you can relate to this guy. And I'm, before I say this, you know, sometimes we show, we show videos that we know that is going to touch the, the hearts of ladies more than guys. This one's for the guys. Ladies, you can watch too, but this, one, this one's for you guys, all right? Go ahead. Welcome back to our coverage of the game of the year between Yale and North Carolina. If you're just joining us, we have witnessed an unbelievably well-fought match tonight. So now the burden rests on Yale's Scott Sterling. Here he comes, nerves of steel, that man, dealing with more pressure now than a submarine. Johnson places the ball on the spot, getting ready. That man literally has a cannon for a leg. Yes, he does. Here he goes, winding up for the shot, and... Oh! The cannon has fired and hit Sterling directly to the face! We clocked that at a stunning 116 kilometers per hour. Now that's a lot of miles per hour! Little chance that man's nose is not broken right now. <laughs> oh, indeed. Now Sterling getting checked out for that one. Spectacular save, though, but sadly, he's not out of the woods yet. On his feet now, a bit shaken. But not Stern. <laughs> <laughs> this crowd absolutely loves this man. And Sterling's teammates welcome him back, a hero. Show. Back now to Scott Sterling. He looks a bit worse for wear, but ready for round two. And Shaw takes a moment. Here he goes with the approach. Oh! oh! Sterling with the fantastic dive. The ball flies straight through his hands and once again strikes him straight in the schnoz. And let's see it again on the old instant replay. Oh, every excruciating <laughs> detail captured in HD perfection. Clocked at 129 kilometers per hour. Yeah, Sterling right. does not look well. Two wonderful saves and two definite concussions. They may replace him at this point. He's done all he can. Yes, as his trainer takes him off the field like a mustached lion dragging a gazelle through the Serengeti. Adieu, Scott Stern. Adieu. Let's see who they got to replace Scott Stern. Scott, Scott Sterling! Sterling is back! He's still in the game! Oh my! And he's taking a very odd tactic now. Seems to be curling up to protect his face. Not exactly a recommended technique, but here it goes. Wait, no, no. Lampert needs to tie his shoe. Ho <laughs> ho. And that's why you do a double knot, kids. Sterling, still waiting for the kick to happen. He's probably wondering when. Oh! 
Oh, sweet butter crumpet! My the God. ball drills Sterling right in the face. That man's nose must be absolutely <laughs> devastated. He's going to look like a witch that blew her broom into her nose and then crashed into a hammer. I hardly even care about this attempt. Let's go back to Scott, Scott Sterling, the man, the myth, the, the legend. legend. Three perfect blocks by Sterling and his cat-like face reflexes. Absolutely incredible. Though I must say, Sterling does not look well at all. Well, well you know football players like that a bit of drama, don't they? They're gonna take him out. No, wait! They brought him a chair! Oh, a bold move by the manager! Hey. Bane sets up for the fourth attempt! And this, frankly, is a gimme. He literally just has to kick it anywhere except where Sterling is sitting. There is no possible way that North Carolina can mess up this shot. Oh! 158 kilometers per hour! This man can do no wrong! Look at him beg for mercy when it's mercy that should be begging for him! He has looked death in the eye and said, take your best shot! To which death replies by punching him in the face over and over and over again. Scott Sterling! His face is like a brick wall! A brick wall that can feel pain and cries a lot. But where's Sterling? Oh, he seems to be crawling away from the goal. What is he doing? He's throwing away the bat! Oh! Oh! Sterling has done the impossible! Oh! I can't believe it! Look at that! Oh! He played it just right! There's probably times we can all relate to Scott Sterling, amen? And, and think about it. I mean, there's times that life hits you upside the head, and not only once, but over and over and over uh, again. And I want you to say, if you're going through a tough time right now in your life or just a tough season, this message is for you. If you are not going through a tough time right now, uh, it's okay, and we're, you know, we don't hate you or anything, but, but the thing is, put this on the back burner because you're going to need this someday. Someday you're going to need to remember what we're talking about to, uh, today. And we're going to only talk about half of it. We're going to be like a movie, you know, where it's halfway, and it just gets the good stuff, and then you, it's continued the next, the next movie. That's kind of where we are on this. We're going to get to the good stuff, and it's going to be some good stuff, but really next week is where it all concludes. So make sure you, do, you watch. Make sure you come next, uh, next week. And really the hero of this story is a guy by the name of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was one of the four greatest kings in the history of Judah and, uh, and Israel. An amazing, amazing man of God. And, he, and, and listen to what happened to him in one day. You think you had a bad day. It's this. After, uh, after this, the Mev and, uh, Moabites, the Ammonites, and some of the Maonites came to make war on Jehoshaphat. I mean, think of that. Make war on you. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom on the other side of the sea. It is already at Hazar Tamar, where that is in Gedi. And so this guy has this huge problem. I mean, imagine this. It is easy for us just to read this. Think about an entire vast army coming to kill you, to annihilate you, to destroy you and everything you love and everybody you care about. That's what they're going through right now. And this thing came out of the blue. I mean, this came out of nowhere. He did nothing to provoke this. He did nothing wrong. In fact, this guy has done everything right. This is an amazing, righteous guy. In fact, he, he really led a revival into, uh, into Israel, into Judah, because he was, uh, they were worshiping false gods at this time. I mean, they were worshiping on, on all the mountaintops, bowing down to idols, bowing down to things that their hands had made, bowing down to, uh, to, to poles that represented phallic symbols and just horrible, terrible things. That's what they were doing. And Jehoshaphat, this righteous king, said, not on my watch. Uh-uh. We are no longer doing that. We are from now on. We are going to worship the one true God. And as they did that, God brought revival into their, into their heart. And you know, something, too, is, is uh, sometimes things just happen in life. I had a friend who went through trouble after trouble after trouble, and he said this. He said, man, maybe I've just done something wrong. And, you know, maybe you're feeling that way. Maybe you're feeling and hearing that lie from the enemy. Really, there's, there's four reasons that we go through pain and suffering on this earth. One time, it's because of decisions we make, right? We can all say, I, I made stupid choices, I made stupid decisions, and it brought pain into my life. There's other times it's because of somebody else made decisions and some choices that they made hurt you and it brought pain and suffering in your life. There's other times it's because we just live in a fallen world, right? And we live in a world where there's earthquakes and there's famine and there's, there's war and there's, there's pain and suffering because we live in a fallen world. But there's other times that, that things happen to us, bad things happen because we're following Jesus Christ. Who would you go after if you were Satan? 
Would you go after somebody who's making absolutely no difference whatsoever, who you've already got on your side, basically, or making no difference? Or would you go after the people who are making a difference, who are, who are bringing revival in their life, who are bringing, making a difference in their schools, making a difference in their jobs? Satan goes after those people. So he had done nothing wrong. In fact, he had done everything Right. So here's the big question is why if bad things happen to good people, bad things happen to, to Christians, bad things happen to, you know, to, to non-Christians, then what advantage is it to be a Christian in the midst of a, the struggle? A whole lot. Because first of all, that God promises he's never going to leave you or forsake you in the middle of those struggles. Something else that he promises, he's, he's promising to give you everything that you need to make it through that struggle. He's going to give you all the grace you need. He's going to give you all the love you need. He's going to give you all the courage you need, all the comfort you need, all the power you need. Whatever it is, he's going to give you that. He promises that to, to his, his children. Another thing he promises, he promises that he's going to work all things together for good for his, for his children. That doesn't say everything's going to be good, but he's going to work it to good. And something else we know as believers, it's all going to work out in the end. I've read the end of the book, and we win, y'all, okay? We win and say amen, right? And the, the second thing is the problems came in waves. It didn't, this wasn't just one army. I mean, think of this. This was three armies, each of which were stronger than they were. Three different armies coming, coming at you at, at one time. And sometimes that happens, isn't it? Problems come in waves. I, I think I told this story a, few, a couple years ago, and it's a story of there's two times in my life I absolutely thought I was going to die. There's several times I could have died, but there were two times I really, really thought this is it. One time was after a mission trip to Brazil, and we had a day off and everything. I've, you know, I love waves. I've always loved waves. I've always loved body surfing from the time I was a little kid. The bigger the wave, the better for me. But man, I've never seen waves like this. I mean, we got out there, and there was, and the waves were, and really, there were only a couple people there, and the waves were about two stories tall. I mean, you put your head down and look at a two-story building, that's how big these things were. So I got out there, I didn't realize how big they were until, and all of a sudden, the first came, wave came, and I thought, I'm going to go under you. And I've never been to a wave, I've never seen a wave that would not let you go through it. It said, no, nah, I don't think so. And it hit me. And I mean, turn me which way but loose. I, had, I truly had no idea which way was up. And I was probably down seven to nine seconds, I'd say somewhere around there. And that's a long time to be underwater, just floundering around, not knowing where to go. I finally just got up and just got my breath. And here comes wave number two that annihilates me again. And again, same thing. When this happens and you only catch a few breaths in, a few, in, in several minutes, man, you, uh, my body was going down quick. And so I've been that way in life, too, haven't you? Where you just go and suddenly you, you think you, you get hit by something, just comes out, of, sometimes out of the blue, a, you know, a, a, a something that happens in your relationship, something that happens to you in, uh, in marriage, something that happens to you financially, something, that, and you just go, whoa. And then all of a sudden you think you're just catching your breath, and boom, here comes the, the car breaks down. Boom, another financial bill. Boom, something happens with the kids. Something happens at work. And you just get your head up, and you're just starting to get things, and boom, it happens again. And this is exactly what they were facing, where these things were coming in, uh, coming in waves, one after, after the other. And I will say, okay, what happened to me in the story? I did live. I know that shocks you. I did live to tell about it. But there was a friend of mine who, uh, that was on that trip as well, and he saw me floundering, and there was a lull in the waves for a second, and he reached out there, and he grabbed me and pulled me back. I thank God. I thank my friend. I literally kissed the ground and everything. But sometimes things happen in waves. And I'll tell you, I don't know how many times my Jesus has walked into my waves and the struggles and everything, and he's pulled me out, and he's, uh, he's rescued me. That's the God we serve. The other thing is not only did it come in waves, but it got be worse before it got better, Right? I mean, it said that, that not only do you have three armies coming at you, they're already in in Getty. Now, that may not mean anything to you or to, to me because of, you may not know the geography there, but that's like saying, oh, by the way, they're in North Charlotte heading this way. So they don't have, they don't have days to prepare for this. They don't even have hours to pre prepare for this army. They have minutes to prepare for the army that is coming, that is coming their way. But, and, and some of you, we know what that feels like too, don't we? That we may go to marriage counseling and things, we really want to work on that, and before it gets better, things get worse, and you're fighting more and everything like that, or, or maybe you're, you're praying for somebody, and you're praying for them to get better, but before they get better, they actually take a turn for the, for the worse. 
Or maybe your, your child that you love and you care about, before they get better, they go even wilder. They go even crazier. It gets worse before it gets, uh, before it gets better. So here's the question. What do we do about that? We're going to give some principles that we see from, these, uh, from, this, from Jehoshaphat and these guys, and we're going to see what they did about us so we can learn the, uh, the same thing. And the first thing he did is he immediately inquired of God. Here it is. Alarmed. Yeah, I bet that was an understatement. Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. The very first thing he did is going, God, what do you want me to do about this? God, I'm looking to you. And that's great, and that's something we need to remember because a lot of times we do at least two and usually three things before we go to God. We first go to the room called the panic room, right? And we go, oh, man, what am I going to do? What's going to, how, what, where are we going to, wow. And we go into a full-blown panic. The second we hear bad news, the second we have something tragic, the second comes in, we go into full-blown panic. The second thing a lot of times we do is we go into the figured-out room. And we go, okay, now that this has happened, what are we, we, we got to figure this out. What are we going to do? How are we going to do this? How are we going to get by this? And we go to our own resources, we go to our own ingenuity, and everything that we have to try to figure it out. A lot of times we go to the third room, and that's the phone, phone a friend room, too, and, man, you wouldn't believe what happened. And we do all these, and we do these things before we inquire of God, and oftentimes God is our last resort instead of our first resource which is what he's doing here. We need to make God our first resource when tragedy and struggle comes. The second thing is, it says he inquired of the Lord and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. He didn't just fast, he proclaimed a fast for the entire land. Now, what is fasting? Fasting simply means to, to go without for a spiritual purpose. It can be going out, with, uh, out of food for a day or for, for a few days. It can be doing something else that maybe means a lot to you, like going, out with, going without coffee, going without TV, going without without uh, you know phone or internet or something like that for a while that you're focusing you're spending that time focusing on god instead and i'm probably going to give you a very unspiritual thing what what fasting is but I, I believe in it i practice it and something that it does for me is man it first of all it laser beams that my my attention on god i think it's also saying this it's like putting putting all caps in a prayer to god going god i really need you man i really 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 need you it's a time when i say to my flesh you don't you don't own me God owns me. This flesh does, isn't going to have the way. And it's like, uh, and you know what it's like? It's like one time we were here in the office, and when they were fixing or building the apartments out here, uh, that, you know, we'd hear them you know, doing stuff, but all of a sudden one time it was bam! And I mean, it sounded like a truck ran into the church, and we're all like, we yell out at the same time, what was that? And we realized afterwards they did about two or three more times that they were dynamiting over there. Now, usually they were just using the heavy equipment to get through the rocks, but occasionally the breakthrough was so big that it needed to be so big that they needed dynamite. And that's us sometimes. You know, there's a passage in the Bible, there's a story in Mark chapter 9 where, where the, there was a, a guy that was possessed, and the disciples, they prayed for him and everything, and nothing happened, and Jesus came up and prayed for him and, the, and everything great. And the disciples are going, how did you do that? And we couldn't do that. And he said, sometimes it needs prayer and fasting in order for there to be a breakthrough. And sometimes if you're looking through a breakthrough, maybe, maybe spend some time just focusing on God in, uh, in, in fasting as well. The third thing he did is he prayed. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said, now watch what he did not say. What we a lot of times is we immediately go for the God, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. Watch what he does. O oh Lord God of our fathers, you are the God who, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. The very first thing he did is he focused on God's power and his greatness. What does that do? What happens when we focus on our problems? We focus on that problem, what happens? It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until we can't even see anything else except our problem. And what happens when we start saying, when we start declaring who God is and we go, God, you are so good. God, you're faithful. Here's what I know about you. You're faithful. God, you are strong. God, you love me. And suddenly that problem, we can't even see the problem because we're looking at the bigness, the greatness of, uh, of God. This is one thing David was great at. Moses was great at, of just saying, God, here's who you are. I declare you're faithful, you're good, you're kind, you're great, you're everything. And suddenly God becomes so big and our problem becomes much smaller as we focus on the, the greatness of, of God. Another thing is, is he recounted the, God's faithfulness. Listen to this. 
Oh, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people, Israel, and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your, your friend? This is, again, something that I think is so powerful. When we get into a fix, when something is coming against us, when life is too much for us, to remember how God has helped us in the past, especially in the very areas that we're struggling with, right? Because we can do one of two things. We can forget what God has done, and we can go and, as if God, this is what bugs me. This is what bugs me about me, that a lot of times God has delivered me from something again and again and again, and the next time I face it, it's like God, I sometimes get spiritual amnesia and forget God's track record with me. It's when I stop and I focus and go, God, you know what? You've helped me in this area again and again and again and again. You've been strong, you've been strong. Listen to what happened to the people who forgot in Psalms 106. They forgot the God who saved them, who has done great things in Egypt, miracles in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Their lack of remembering led to a lack of faith. Their lack of faith led to them doing laps in the wilderness for 40 years. And we can either focus on God's, God's incredible uh, pro, you know, provisions and taking care of us and how he rescued us in the past, and we can, it can, again, it can strengthen our faith, or we can forget about it, and it can hurt our faith. The next thing is, he reminds himself of God's promises. And he said this, well, I'll just go on and go into this. He, he goes in and saying, God, you've done this, and you've done you this, and you've done this. I want to just show you something here. This is, this is my iPad, and I, do, uh, I usually do my devotions uh, with, with the iPad and everything. And if you'll see something, my, there's a lot of different color in there. I do it for different things. The, white, the yellows are like commandments that he gives and just things like that. There's, there's green. Every time there's a miracle or something that God does out of the ordinary, I, I, I want to focus on that. But there's times also that are blue. And these blues are God's promises. And I'll tell you, there's something that happens to me when I am going through a tough time. And I'll just go to the blues, man. I will just, I can focus on all those blues and just go promise, promise, promise. Because something happens when I recount the promises of God and what he's said. And I'll just tell you, this is what, you know, things like, things like this. He said this, you are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. And then what I'll do is there, I'll go and I'll make it my prayer and going, God, you know what? You are my hiding place. I can rest in you. I can trust in you. And God, you don't just deliver me. You surround me with songs of deliverance. And I think when you start doing that, suddenly your faith starts to, starts to grow. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the ones who trust in, uh, in him. Then we go on, the, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. God, thank you that your angels right now are encamping around me, and you're going to deliver me because I honor, I honor you. And how about, how about this one? The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them and delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And we can go, God, thank you. You're near me right now because my heart is broken. You're delivering me. And something about remembering the promises. And I'll tell you something. When my kids were younger, uh, one thing I wanted to instill the word of God in their hearts so that they could come out with any problems and they could say the, the promises of God. And so one thing I would do with them is every time they memorized seven scriptures, I'd take them out for a big celebration of ice cream. Take them that, man, they could get anything they, they wanted. And something that was, was cool there is, is some of the times they would go, they knew when they got seven, they'd go, come on, Dad, we got seven. And they'd get the car, the keys, throw me the keys, and they'd be in the car waiting for me. And you know what I loved about that? I loved they trusted me, that I made a promise and they trusted me so much they got in the car and waited for me. And I could blow it, and I make mistakes, and I, you know, I try to, but it, didn't, it did not bug me that they were doing that. It excited me that they believed in me so much. They trusted in my promise so much that they actually got in the car. And what I want to do is I want to trust in God so much that I get in the car, and I'm waiting for the ice cream long before the thing ever happens. Amen? And so, and real short, too. He tells God, uh, now he goes to the, pro, the, he tells the problem, and he tells the need. And he goes this, he said, God, this is what we need from you. This is what we need, this is what we need. And I love that, that they went for the ask. He told God, and it's not like he was telling God what he needed. God knew what he needed. He wasn't informing God. God wasn't going, oh, really? There's an army coming against you? I had no idea, man. I'm so glad you told me about that. They knew, uh, he knew this, but here's what God says. God is all about relationship, and relationship is about communication, and God wants us to go for the ask. He says, ask, and it will be given to you. He says in, in John 7, he says in John 14, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may be glorif glorify the Father. You may ask me anything in my name, and I will do it. 
Luke 11. If then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, when they ask, how much will my heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And then there was one time I was with a, a, a 20-some-year-old guy, and he's just bemoaning. He goes, he goes, I have never been on a date in my life. I mean, I've never been on a date. And I said, have you ever asked a lady out? He goes, well, no. I said, Sparky, A plus B equals C. You're not going to get, one thing I guarantee, you're not going to get an a, a, a yes if you never go in for the ask. And the Bible says that we have not because we what? Because we ask not. Go for the ask. God's not afraid to, to do that. And, all, and finally, he declared his utter dependence on God. He said, oh, Lord, oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. For we, uh, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. To me, this is the most beautiful thing. They're going, God, this is too much for us. We're overwhelmed. This enemy is too strong. God, we do not have what it takes to do this. But we know you do. And I remember 24 years ago, right about now to this day, they, uh, when we started the church, Crossroads is what was called a parachute drop. They basically threw us out of the plane and said, start a church, right, on the way down. And we, we didn't even own a pencil. We didn't own chairs. We had to borrow pencils. We had to borrow chairs when we first started, started out. And this is one of those times that I was so overwhelmed. I said, God, if you don't show up, I'm dead. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been and there's, the mountain is so big, the struggle is so hard, the, the, the river is so wide, you're going, God, if you don't show up right now, if you don't show up financially, if you don't show up relationally, if you don't show up, we are, we are dead. And then one of the things that I love is watch this, one of the most tender places in the whole Bible. All the men of Judah, with their wives and children and their little ones, they stood before the Lord. Can you see this powerful thing? They're all just in front of their tents just going, God, we don't have it. We don't have what it takes. But Lord, we're looking, we're looking to you. And I remember one time my, my little grandson, uh, we, were at the, we were in Tulsa and we were at the Tulsa Zoo. His name's Josiah. I love him to death. And he was, um, and, and when he was a little, little kid, we're at the zoo and he runs a little bit ahead of me and all of a sudden there's somebody with a leaf blower. Wah, 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 wah. And he turns around, his eyes are this big and he comes running up to me like this. And you know what he's really saying by doing this? He's going, Grandpa, I don't have what it takes and I'm scared right now, but I know you have what it takes and I know you're going to take care of me. And so I picked him up and I comforted him and I killed that man with the leaf blower. <laughs> But you know what God does when we come and we just say, God, it's too much for me. It's too much for us as our family. It's too much, and it's a, but I know it's not too much for you. And God, I look to you. And here's one of the reasons I raise my hand in service, to just go, God, I love you, and I need you, and you're bigger than me, and you're bigger than the problem. And so, and I believe God wraps us in his arms. He comforts us, and he opens up a can on Satan for whatever is causing us that pain and that suffering. We could bow our head and close our eyes. And I want you to think about what you're struggling with right now in your life. What's an issue? And again, maybe everything's hunky-dory great. Praise God. But if there's an issue right now, focus on what is that. And what I want you to do is instead of focusing on that, I want you to turn your eyes towards God and your heart towards God. And just begin to adore Him. Tell him how faithful he is. Acknowledge his love for you. And the fact that he's more committed to you than you are to yourself. Proclaim his power. Proclaim his majesty. And now recount what he's done to you. Remember the times he's seen you through times he's provided, the times he's gotten you to the other side of the mountain you thought you'd never get to. Remind yourself, or maybe remind God of his promises. Maybe you don't even know what those are. I'll lend you some. He says he will supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Claim that. He says you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. He says though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to fear an evil because he's with you. He says when you walk through the water, 
they will not over it will not overtake you when you go through the fire go through the fire you will not be burned he says he's going to work all things together for good because you love him and are called according to his purpose grab hold of that and claim those promises Make the request. Go for the ask. Ask God what you need to ask Him for. And watch and see what happens. If we could stand, there's going to be people here that want to pray for you, the prayer team. And please, if you're going through a hard time, this is what church is about. This is why we need our brothers and sisters for moments just like this to say, have somebody else to go. Because sometimes, I don't know about you, sometimes I'm so hurt or whatever it is that it's hard to even pray for myself. And there's going to be people down here that want to pray for you. And, and God bless you.